Yeah. Alright, who has questions? I guess you can print the gun, but you can't print the ammunition, right? So, uh, the point of control is going to be the ammunition. Well, I think printable ammunition is in the same way. We'll figure out how to do a primer and a cartridge. I mean, we just made some decisions, you know, we decided if we wanted this to happen at all, let's make some executive decisions quickly, and we just decided to design around a round. Um, 22 LR is what's in the video, but right now we're working with the 12 gauge, the, uh, the 38 special, the 45 long pole, much lower pressure rounds. Design something first, put in updates, release early, release often, you know, printable ammo, six months. <laughs> Uh, what's the difference between owning a gun and being able to print a gun when you need it? I mean, would you expect people to actually print them out? I, I don't know, actually. Uh, I think if it, especially if it gets the reputation of being unsafe, whether deserved or not, yeah, people may not adopt, and that's a really big issue. Legally, I see a huge distinction. My, my background's in, well, not really bad, I'm in law school, okay? I don't know what that means, but I see a huge distinction legally between owning a gun and being able to print the gun, uh, as you've styled it there. Anyone can have a file. Uh, perhaps most people wouldn't print. They would just have something of a psychological security, if that makes sense. Or maybe it's just a, a pure novelty. And this might just be a complete flash in the pan novelty. Um, the materials may not allow anything for free years to come. I don't know. You know that we're at such an early stage. That, that's the best way I can answer your question. Did, did you intend for me to say something else? <laughs> Okay, so I think it's a question for all of you. And I, I would like to ask, what do you think is the perfect country? Or maybe you could give us like an example. Because uh, I would not to uh, tell first which which country I think is perfect because I don't want to, to suggest to you. So uh, the question is, which country is the, the most perfect or two or three countries for all of you? What, which country you think is like the law, the people, the government, which country is the best in the world? <laughs> but except your own country. Uh, do you mean like in relation to Bitcoin? Yes. Um, well, from the perspective of my, my talk, it's, it's uh, very difficult to say because it's, it's such a new issue and there really isn't any, any legislation to believe or any clarity to it at this point. So, so not only with Bitcoin, but with Bitcoin and not uh, the, you know the, the law, the government, the rules. Ah, uh, right. Um, right. Um, uh, that's a difficult one. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> Since I'm in London, and since it's 2012 with all oh, what happened, I will answer Ecuador. Uh, Ecuador's got some real nationalization problems, so no for me. Um, oh, do they as well? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, obviously Ecuador is not perfect because they're putting some of their journalists into prison uh, if they don't write stuff to the liking of the president. There is no perfect country uh, and, uh, and no system is perfect uh, because we are not. We are the system. So uh, it just depends how you see your reality, which is the most perfect country. It depends on you. Okay, thank you. So, in my opinion, uh, as far as I was reading and making research, uh, the countries which were, which for me would be perfect are like, like some Caribbean islands, like San Lucia, uh, Barbados, or maybe St. Kitts and Nevis, something like this. I, th I think maybe though the, <laughs> trying to say, say like which country is the most perfect, there are many different ways of looking at uh, countries, you know, you can say which is most economically well off, which is the highest stand has the highest standard of living, which has the greatest freedom of speech. You know, there are many different ways, and it really depends on your character. There are some freedom indexes floating around out there. I mean, the ones that I, the ones that have the factors that I like, suggest Hong Kong is perhaps one of the greatest places to live right now. That's where I'd go if I had to get the hell out of Dodge. You know, or if I could get over there. Uh, citizenship is. 
I forget how difficult it is to establish, and then visa problems and, and getting work and employment. But other than that, I think Hong Kong, by a lot of standards that are important to me, is, is one of the most free, if we can say, free from constraint uh, places on the planet. So how about that? It's not a country, but, you know. He might be invaded by the Chinese. Yeah, he does, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe at the gates. I mean, that's where There is no safe place. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I, for example, have very different standards. And I, uh, I uh, think North Europe is where I come from. Of course, it's not in terms of freedoms, but in terms of uh, like um, happiness index and that kind of stuff. It's if that's what you mean, that is a really nice place to live. But of course, as as said, it's uh, totally up to the qualifiers. Yeah, well, it was uh, Gorbachev. It was when I think it was Clinton and Gorbachev was speaking, and no, it's Reagan. Reagan said, "Oh, in America, we have." Uh, we have free speech, and uh, Gorbachev says we have free health care. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was. Um, my question is for Yuri. Is that how you pronounce your name? I'm sorry. Uh, is that how you pronounce your name? Yeah, Yuri. Cool. Uh, okay, you mentioned Bitcoin inspiring changes in behavioral patterns. Along with the global paradigm shift you pre um, in moral values and worldviews that you predict, what societal implications do you envision this having? Um, what kind of social um, implications do you? Yeah, like the way people relate to each other and we function as a system. Um, well, it's um, I think it's a part of the part part of a bigger paradigm shift, which is, as somebody mentioned here earlier, it's a, it's this shift towards a more decentralized world. We're seeing, except for example. Uh, Energy production is getting more decentralized. Uh, local local economies are are coming up, and uh, basically, um, governmental power is becoming more decentralized, and information communication, and uh, so it's it's a part of this uh, bigger shift towards a global decentralized world, I think. And the quality maybe between people a little bit more. In the way Sorry, can you can you speak up a little bit, like? Sorry. <laughs> And um, equality, maybe, in terms oh, of how equality. we relate to each other. Yeah, equality. Well, defi definitely. I think it's uh, it will will eventually lead to a more equal world. I think. I mean, Jeremy Rifkin, for example, spoke of, spoke of something very similar, where he said that um, that energy production and um, and um, I'm sorry, I can't remember what it was, but but um, yeah. Anyway, conclusively, I, I think it's uh, just a part of uh, this transformation to a more equal and more distributed world. But it's it's going to be a painful transition, probably in many ways. So it's not going to come quickly. Yes. Um, I'd like to ask Cody the question. Let's supposing your projects really successful. Where would you stop? Supposing you could um, print better devices for killing people than guns. Nerve agents. Yeah. Nuclear weapons. Um, where would you stop? This, this is something we've, we've discussed internally as well. I, I'd go ahead and I'm going to nix the nuclear thing right now. Not because it's not a good idea, but I think materially it's still very difficult to achieve. So this no, no. I'm saying supposing it was possible. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not I that. I don't think you can you can make a hypothetical like that because I mean that's the rarest elements on Earth are used. I mean, fast plutonium breeder reactors and everything are used using an element that you have to always assume is rare. It's it's that it's its rarity that makes the element what it is. Yeah, uh, it's hard to explain. But I mean, this I, is a philosophical question. Okay. In the same way that the reason you're doing this is yeah. philosophical. It's right. not because you want everyone to have guns and be right. killing people, is it? It's well, because no. you want to look at the philosophical implications right. of this. Right. And I'm asking the question because of the philosophical implications. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, I think uh, there's a Slashlight interview where they pretty much ask, well, what about nuclear devices? And I, it's a question I, I, can't, I can't answer. Let's say it was possible to give everyone a nuclear device. How? What would happen when someone misuse it? I mean, almost invariably, right? Will that will that be a limiter to what we're doing? No. I mean, would we approach nuclear devices? No, I don't think we would try that. But only for material for material reasons. I think I can't give a, a philosophical defense. And 
Hi. Yeah. Can I say something? Uh, I think that history shows that whatever the technology is, uh, it's always or always has been in the long run better for the society to actually to implement the technology into use, despite of any negative con uh, negative um, collateral effects it might have. For example, nuclear power came from nuclear weapons or after nuclear weapons. So, so it's it's very difficult once some some technology exists. It's very difficult for a society not to actually take take it into use because eventually it's going to happen. The technology is going to be produced somewhere elsewhere. So if if Cody here was to decide to back off from this project, somebody else would do it eventually. And and it's just this. Um, in this kind of world that we live in, we just have to sort of try to rise above that and, and get beyond the problems instead of holding, shutting down the Pandora's box and never talk, touching it. Because I think that's the that's the way to go about. I just wanted to add something. Um, I think that the idea of everybody owning their own nuclear weapon is kind of it's the, it's the logical end of what was begun by Oppenheimer. And that's why we, as inventors, need to think very hard about the long-term social implications of what we are inventing. So when you, so not you, but Oppenheimer, who originally said, we're going to make this thing for the Germans, except that he didn't realize that really he was making this thing so that we could go through uh, another hundred or a thousand years of uh, proliferation hell, where as one more country and one more country and one more organization got these things. I would say, I really, I, I think there's a, a certain distinction you're trying to um, bring out with the nuclear option. I, I'm, I'm, I really want to speak to it, but that this is like the rough party. Actually, actually, it's actually I, yeah. to be honest, I didn't want to come to your talk because I found it yeah. a bit, the very idea. Um, as an Englishman, right, right. I found it apparent because I. Other anarchists will probably disagree with me, but yeah. I don't really like the idea of people having guns. Um, but having listened to the talk, I find it very challenging. And of course it's going to happen. Who am I kidding? The criminals already have guns. Right. That's the point, isn't it? Oh, please, I mean. Well, I think it's all very well going into these platonic hypotheticals. But when it actually comes down to it, uh, you know, you can't really put us, uh, put blinders on technological progress. History has shown that every time you try to do that, every time you try to restrict technology for the betterment of mankind, it only leads to repression. Uh, this is like one of the evils now that we're trying to fight. You know, you can't say, you know, the whole purpose, you know, a, a computer is a really fantastic device. It, you know like when you have a kettle or a fridge, a kettle heats things up, a fridge cools things down. But this is, a computer is a very different kind of appliance, it's a general purpose computing. And the thing is, is when you want to say to someone, you can't use this piece of technology, which is, is there to allow you to express your individualism in any way you can, want, the only way you can do that is through you know, uh, repression and surveillance and all of these very dark things that we're now fighting against. And it's, you can't say that, oh, printing guns, that's, you know, so, you know, oh, what if, what if you could make biological, web? well, you know, it's going to happen. And it, yeah. there's nothing that can be done to stop it, really. I enjoyed the talk, by the way. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I see your point there with this talk. And I don't completely disagree, but I think um, it would probably be smarter to put more energy into more efficient countermeasures against weapons but in building weapons so we can have some devices that somehow scramble the operational functionality of guns or nuclear devices or whatever. I mean, it's probably hard to scramble a mechanical device, but you can probably heat rays or so that just heat up the device so that people cannot operate them anymore. But that would probably be smarter to like level the ground on the playing fields of uh, crap heads that just yeah. like violence. Yo, Daniel, you know when I was at, when I was in the room lab hacker space, they had a they had a talk by biology hackers, and one of the prefixes they said is uh, I, I went into this lecture and I said, oh, yo, by the way, uh, you know I had this idea that you know when people get a virus and they try and quarantine someone, they try and isolate them so the virus doesn't spread. 
What if now you could have an online marketplace where people could upload the genomes of viruses and then other people could download them and replicate them somewhere else? And it's as if a virus doesn't spread for a physical medium but through cyberspace. And this could be operated with markets that allow people to buy the biology. Like, oh, you don't know about that. They gave me a leaflet. And I was reading through this leaflet and it's really fascinating stuff because they're saying about, oh, you know it's very difficult to do citizen biology because right now the the costs because of legislations and safety measures and so on doesn't make it practical for uh, normal people to do science, to do biology. And then I'm reading through this leaflet and he goes, warning, do not use biological agents. Warning, do not use viral agents. Warning, chemical burns. Well, There's loads and loads of warning. It really made me think this is a really different hacking culture because in the computing world, if something is possible, it will be done. And nobody can stop you doing it. Um, I guess my question, well, my question was more, actually, my question was pretty much answered, so I'll just give it back to you. <laughs> I just want to ask uh, to Brigitte and to Jaramil, have you heard about the prospect of technological, what they call technological unemployment, and if you have how do you propose we can go beyond the old game of selling labor for currency? Well, first of all, we should start retributing better the, the small acts, from, starting from the small acts that actually we benefit in our lives. We should retribute honestly the, the care and the passion that people put in, in any work. We shouldn't pay less people just because they are cleaning uh, the, the, the ground. We, and, and then we can just make we, 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 what we have. we have. We will need less work, but we'll still need uh, work from people and we just have a better situation. Um, you know, nowadays the wages of, of actual workers if you see, for instance, like uh, uh, factories, they are going down. Uh, they, are, they are really going down. Where one could argue that one percent is still earning more and more and bonuses and all that for transferring those those uh, factories uh, abroad and uh, and making people unemployed. This is like what Italy and other places in Europe have been facing in the last ten years. And. Uh, <coughs> In these situations, what we need to do is just like keep the work where it is, and and retribute the people that are working, not just like treat them bad because they have a lower education. We are um, we are valuing too much also like the piece of paper that declares if someone has studied or not. So we should actually uh, also England here is facing uh, less uh, less. Uh, uh, people into education uh, institutions, less people is signing up for universities because it's too expensive and these people probably have great qualities that they are not able to declare on a piece of paper nor, uh, nor uh, grow into, into such a university. Well, they will find a job and they should be retributed well for the passion that they put in that job, not for the piece of paper that they have. Yeah. So, less jobs, yes, but uh, better retributed, circulate the, the wealth, definitely. It's a, it's a crucial uh, thing that we need to change. Yeah, and I would like to agree with this, and I would like to add that uh, uh, if we have more self-sustainability in our communities, uh, and if we stop importing tulips to Holland from Kenya, and rather inspire and, and help the farmers there to create something that they can use in their community, we would have a very different world. Uh, but we are all participating in this insanity of consumerism. Uh, so each and every one of us have to change the way we relate to the stuff we use every day. And thus we don't have to work so much. And I guess that one of the first battles we lost as humanity is during the uh, freedom for slaves in the United States. There was also wage slavery uh, battle that got lost. So most people are kept busy working too many hours for too little money uh, so they can buy crap.
So if I can add uh, something to it also, I'm very, I mean, something pretty political. I'm extremely surprised by the agenda of the conservatives, which historically, until the period of Reagan, were for local labor. Like there was a big uh, highlighted thing in the agenda of conservatives, in the US at least. You know, like we want to have stuff made in the USA and we are proud. I, actually, it's, it was good quality. What is made there is still good quality. It's not anymore the agenda of the conservatives. Since Bush um, uh, senior on, it came in, it, it, it crawled in this different agenda of just like exporting the production somewhere else, no care anymore about who is working in which country and who is proud of what, and just like buy it from China. And that's the agenda of the conservatives right now. I'm very surprised. There is no more, uh, uh, you know, like, <laughs> Uh, discussion there, I think it's. Uh... Yeah, I mean, I mean, as long as we're buying stuff from areas like China, where we know that most of the stuff we buy, the Christmas lights, are all made in uh, sweatshops in prisons, where people are imprisoned for their political opinions, and they're made to work until they drop uh, and die. Uh, and as long as we participate in this, we are just as guilty as the capitalists that we are pointing our fingers at, or the communists, or whatever we choose to call it. I have a um, question for Brigitta. At uh, uh, your speech. Uh, hello. Very special microphone. This works. Freedom of speech. You said that uh, we should think about uh, proposals of uh, what laws we would like to have for Bitcoin. Do you think it's also important to, to think what laws uh, we should remove? Are there too many laws which prevent the adoption of Bitcoins, which, which make it difficult? For example, laws about money laundering, which, which would be very difficult to, to make Bitcoin and the political forces which, which push money laundering idea forward and forward to exist, coexist together. I just want to add one thing also. And this is mostly to Yuri and Birgitta. Uh, you know when you have like a legal system which is so complex that now to understand this legal system you need to employ professionals. Like is there something a bit perverse about that? Yeah, I think this uh, this got the. Uh, I'm Daniel. For some reason, I was like suggested to come up front and answer some questions. Oh, I thought it'd be funny. But uh, <laughs> I think the general problem here is that we uh, test. Yeah, the, the legal system got more complex than is actually necessary because, as in any case, the the people who designed the system in the first place were also the first people to profit from the system. And if you look at just our current monetary system, you will clearly see that this system is completely broken if you're not one of the designers that is actually profiting from it. We have the same case with the entire legal system all over the world. And this is the problem. Now we have the problem that the ruling class, if you want to put it like polemic, is still in charge of keeping track of all the laws. So we have a problem like with this democracy simulation to counter this and to simplify this again. But um, yeah, I think the, the Icelandic uh, constitution was a step in the right direction. If we could have more of that, it could also help like pro propagate Bitcoin compatibility to, to economic systems and all that stuff. Um, fluffy on it. Um, Okay, so one thing that can be done, like we have just been looking at the whistleblowing laws in Iceland uh, and we discovered we've got a legal expert to look at all the different gag orders that uh, people in the public sector are placed under and it was uh, streamlined and all the unnecessary articles were taken out. Uh, and uh, so maybe if you can have an expert into looking at all the different uh, sort of complexities to clean it out, it's like... Uh, uh, it's just full of bugs and Trojan horses and stuff like that. Uh, so, um, but we need people, we need lawyers, we need to get lawyers on our side, and those lawyers that are on our side, we need to encourage them and give them projects to do that are in uh, conjunction with every step 
that we're taking and we have to be proactive instead of always being defensive. Thank you. Yeah, um, about the uh, confusing legislation, it's, uh, of course it's not a, like an uh, intrinsic or a, it's kind of a, if, if, you, um, if you have too confusing legislation just for the sake of having it too confusing, of course there's no point to it. But also, if you go too far to the other, other direction and have it too simple, that's no good either, because the situations that have to be resolved are very, very many and very, very different. So, so if you have just like a, like a law that says thou shalt not kill,